All right. Welcome, fellow druids. Uh, I'm trying to do a little something different today with the show. Uh, I've been talking about trying to do this episode for a little bit, and I decided I would go ahead and try to do it. So uh, today we are going to talk about some tactics with uh, shifting stones. And uh, uh, obviously I don't have a full... Uh, table lined up here uh, just at the moment, um, but we should still be able to illustrate uh, what what we want basically to talk about. So um, if my setup, if the sound's a little off, or the lighting's a little off, or anything's a little off, uh, my apologies. This is the first time, um, at least in a very long time, and certainly since I've moved into my new house, that I've even remotely attempted to do this. Um, you know, and of course, there's always a chance of a feisty uh, warp wolf. Uh, husky coming by so um, what I want to talk about is there's a lot of things that uh, playing shifting stones is really key for um, they have obviously changed quite a bit from the transition of mark 2 to mark 3 um, they changed a little bit throughout mark 2 as well so um, if you have played them before then you have a sense um, and we've obviously that you should be able to go back through I have probably done an episode on them before um, but we're gonna we're gonna do our best to sort of talk about them. So I have a couple extra models here too, so we'll, we'll use those. So um, first and foremost, let's just go over real quick what they do. Um, they are defense five. They're auto hit and melee. They are armor eighteen. They have five wounds. Um, they're command five, which is important. And um, and then they have three. They have three abilities they do during their activation, and they have a fourth ability that they do all the time. So let's talk about the fourth ability first, actually. Um, that one is Serenity, and that is um, a Fury Management thing. So if you start your during your control phase, if a War Beast is within one inch of a stone, you can remove a Fury from it. So just as a quick demonstration, so let's say we have our Shifting Stones like this, and we've got our uh, Getterix here. Hopefully that's double-shaking my screen. Yep. Uh, and we have our Getterix there. As long as he is within, um, and these are the Muse uh, move line six, just in case. I figure this is going to be easier to illustrate because I can show you exactly how much I'm measuring. Anyways, if you're a war beast that's within an inch of a shifting stone during your control phase, you can have the shifting stone remove that fury instead of your warlock having to do it. Um, this can be really important for your any of your war beast heavy armies, um, or just on a turn that you run hot if you can position well. Um, this is going to really help you uh, be able to manage the fury load that you've put out there. Um, additionally, on turn one, it can be really key. So when you're talking about getting your, your unpacking step down, this is really something you want to look at. So um, I don't have it out here, but um, the like the Una list that I played, I had six Griffins and a Gorax. And I usually don't want, especially if I go second, I don't want her to... Uh, have to spend all of her fury, especially because she wants to move aggressively up the board. I don't want her to. F I don't want to feel like I'm in a place where she might be dead. Um, and so, running with my griffins and then positioning shifting stones so I can remove at least uh, usually three or four fury is is key to what I want to do. Um, also, just as a note, each shifting stone can remove a single fury. So in this case, let's say I need to remove two. Now I have he's within an inch of two of them. I can remove two fury from that model. Um, and then I'm going to grab one more. Uh, okay. And then likewise, if, if I have them set up like this, I can, I can still only remove one fury per stone. So in this case, I could theoretically remove two from Getterix or two from the, uh, Wold Warden that's here, but I could not move, remove two from both of them. I could remove one from one and two from the other. So that's that's the way that works. Okay. So that's that's one of the that's actually a really important ability, and it's one not to forget. Um, but it is it is one of the more s subtle. Well, to an extent, it's one of the more subtle abilities. Um, so then let's just go over uh, a little bit more. In order to do the really interesting things with them, they're going to need to be in command. Um, and that's something you're going to want to be vigilant about throughout the game. So I'm going to move them out of the way for a minute. Um, so, and apologies for not using painted models. I just, um, I could, I just, these were more available to me uh, without having to dig all the way through my bag. So um, their command is five. 
so I'm I'm forming kind of a, a you know fairly uh, uniform triangle here. Uh, so those are all in command. The model with I don't know if you'll be able to see this on the camera, but the model that has the skull on the base of the stone is considered the leader model, and that's important because as if that model dies, command is going to be drawn from the other one. So you might, while this is a legal triangle, and there's definitely gonna be times that you want to set up a triangle like that, if this lead model here dies, one of these, you're gonna to have to promote one of these and they're gonna be, the other one will be out of command. So you'll either have to place back in command or only this one, um, and this one won't be able to be, won't be able to move itself. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just going to touch on this really quickly because I think it's an ability that also goes uh, missed a lot. But uh, and this did change brief uh, a little bit in Mark II, and I realize I don't have uh, a good tool up for that. Um, but it also changed so that the shifting stones now uh, heal if you are within two inches of them. So um, every model um, that is within two inches of the shifting stones. Uh, if you activate healing field, is what I believe the rule is called, uh, will will uh, heal for D3 damage, and that includes constructs, which normally are not just automatically able to be have damage removed from them. Uh, damage removed from them is the, is the actual rule. So in this case, and the shifting stones themselves. So if you activate that ability, every model within two inches of a stone heals D3. So just as uh, an example, this will still only heal this model D3. Same here, even though. Um, I, and I just sort of haphazardly placed that, but they're all there's multiple stones within two inches. It's still per unit of stones. Each be, each piece will heal D three. Um, I'm not going to go a ton into tactics on that. I think it's really obvious what um, how that would be beneficial, uh, particularly in lists where you're looking to uh, grind out in the um, for a long game. It's going to be really important to do that in lists that are uh, world based as far as healing and that don't have Balder. Um, aside from being able to use your um, black clad stone shapers, being able to use these to repair a, a broken system is going to be really important as well. Um, they do heal anything, so keep that in mind. So something um, they might be something you want with death wolves. Um, because that can be really frustrating for your opponent if you can keep them healed and keep them on corpse tokens It's going to be very difficult for them uh, to be killed. Uh, there's a few other things that is that are really important for them uh, Things things like skinwalkers that are able to heal themselves d3 anyways And then they can heal another d3 from shifting stones and they can go up to armor 18 and melee So if you get them really stuck in give them an armor bonus perhaps and then give them healing field you're actually going to keep them on the table for a long time uh, if we're talking about something like the world wrath uh, you'll similarly be able uh, to to keep it alive for a long time you can use two shifting stones units one stone from each unit uh, within range healing field heals in 2d3 you can use other means throughout your army to do additional healing and that's going to keep you know uh, throughout the game that's going to be a lot of damage that you're negating that your opponent's doing <clears throat> so that's basically the gist um, but let's go over first, just real quick, how the Shifting Stones unit itself uh, moves. So this is just the base unit. Let's say we start with a relatively compact formation here. They can place themselves completely... Uh, one of the things they can do, and uh, I believe this one's called Shifting, um, is place themselves completely within 8 inches of themselves. So that's real simple. You could go anywhere up to here. I can do the same here. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be wherever. Uh, and you can go here. One caveat is you do have to place them in formation with the exception that the leader model is exempt from that rule because otherwise you wouldn't be able, um, you basically wouldn't be able to uh, place, you, you'd never really be able to place the unit, right? And, and frankly, the, the leader model is always in formation anyways, so you're, it's, it's always able to place itself wherever you'd like, and then you can have the other stones follow up. Um, stones can be as close together as this, they can be, as I said, spread out as far as five inches um, with, uh, we'll keep it like that, with um, the command of five. So that's how they place themselves. Uh, and this is really important because it means uh, it is a place. Uh, they, you're able to go over top of stuff. You're able to get into really awkward places. 
Um, you're able to sometimes go behind models. So it becomes much more important to remember that it's a place as the game goes on because frequently there's going to come a point where one of them is going to get sniped out or killed or your honestly your opponent may just expend a significant amount of effort to kill them because they're worried about the other shenanigans that we're going to get to. And just remember that you're able to do that and you can go over the backs of stuff and they're actually quite resilient. Um, and that means that you're going to be able to put them into places that can be very difficult for your opponent to deal with. Okay, so um, so that's their basic thing. So then the final basic thing that they're able to do is they have a rule called teleportation. Uh, and apologies, I don't have the rules in front of me. I may have gotten which one they do backwards, but the, the way they operate is still the same. So the way teleportation works is any any model, any friendly faction model that is comp that is within, and, and note that I definitely said within and not completely within, is within the triangle formed by the shifting sins can be placed completely within eight inches of its current location. So in this case, um, what that means is anything that's in. So <clears throat> if you note here that the the base, um, actually let's use this guy, his base is a little easier to see. Uh, if you note here, so let me, I'm gonna try to draw a line here. I know it might be a little hard to see on the camera, I'm not sure. So anything in front of this, so he's got a slide just a smidge under, is within the triangle. There's a sliver of that base that's inside of that triangle. You could more precisely draw this uh, with a laser going from the outside of the curve here to the outside of the curve here. If you are inside of that, you can be placed. Um, so that means if you're here, you could be back here. Um, and it's important, one of the things that I, I like to do to help is watch the curve of the base. So basically, if, you know, once I'm past, you know, if you can kind of imagine where the midline is here, once, if I'm centered on or to the, in this case, my left, uh, kind of your right, I think, as you're watching, of this triangle, I'm probably out of the triangle. Touching the base does not count. I know this is, there's some pedantic argument that the triangle is on the outside, but I'm pretty sure it's been ruled that that does not work, so don't try to do that. However, as we go here, um, and again, this might be difficult to see, but the curve of this base is inside of the curve of this base um, and you know you can see where the line is here so even as far back as here you know as long as I'm past this curve on on the line that it's it's forming here like this you can see I'm just barely in the triangle um, of course I can be in more obvious places too that's obviously in right here in the center is in etc right so that's where you need to be then you can place a model completely within eight inches of its current location so uh, I can do this and that's how that's going to work. Um, if you're not sure about the landing place, this is a great time. Use a proxy base. Um, so in this case, I should be able to check back to back and go and see eight inches. You can do it in either direction. Um, so um, that's the basic operation of how shifting stones work. Um, now I just want to go over one more quick thing. So if you have a stone keeper, um, he's part of the unit as well. Um, although a lot of people don't like him right now and that's fine, he's two points and I, I would say he's definitely not necessary. Uh, what he adds to the unit is he makes them command seven. Um, he has a spell called rock hammer, uh, which gives you some offensive output. Um, he's magic six, so for two points, that's not too bad. Um, and it gets better if you bring a um, wold breath or a celestial fulcrum, which can both make him more accurate. Um, so a command of seven is still uh, is measured from him actually so in this case you can actually form some very large triangles if you so choose so you could go you could go as big as this whereas before and I'm gonna kind of put them inside here before you could do just to sort of do this in the same style you could do basically something like this at about your largest. Now in both cases, if the lead, if one shifting stone dies, um, it will, sorry, not in both cases. In this case, if this shifting stone dies, you're gonna be out of formation. In which obviously once you lose one shifting stone, you're gonna lose your ability to place, which is important. In this larger example, um, once I lose one shifting stone, I'm not gonna be able to place uh, a model with them uh, like I was just illustrating, however, he is the leader of the unit as long as he is attached to them because he has the officer ability or uh, whatever that's called. He has the officer rule. 
So he will still be, they will all, these two would actually still be in formation in this case. Now, depending on your board position, that's obviously quite out of, you know, if this is me facing my opponent, this might be significantly too far forward, might be a concern. Um, keep in mind, his location is not relevant for how you're forming the triangle. He could be, he, uh, they have to be in formation, but aside from needing to be in formation, let's move these out of the way for a minute. He could be here, he could be here as long as that's still seven. Um, he could be over here, he could be way back here, um, etc. The triangles still form using the shifting stones, and if one dies, he does not form a triangle. I did leave off, he also has a defensive spell that just gives him plus four armor. Um, so it actually does make him relatively tanky. If you use the rule that allows the shifting stones to place themselves that turn, he is also part of the unit, and based on the wording of that, he will also be placed com uh, completely within eight inches. If you do that, he will not um, he will not be able to advance that turn. Uh, he can still use either of his magic abilities, he just will not be able to advance. If they use any other ability, he can walk and cast his spells or, or whatever you would like him to do. Uh, theoretically, you could give the press forward order. They will still be able to place. He could charge. You do have to keep everybody in command. Uh, I don't think I've ever had to do that. I'm just letting you know that it is a thing that exists. Um... So one tactic, and this is sort of an advanced technique, I have not actually played a game doing this, but now um, I, I don't have a deployment zone measured out here, so you're going to have to sort of imagine with me. So if if we have this guy, um, and let's let's we're going to purposefully make sure that we've kept our shifting stones in a five inch um, command. So uh, and let's actually keep even. Uh, I don't know which one of these is the skull. Yep, I hit it right. Uh, so we're going to keep these guys all in formation. We'll do a tight formation like that. Um, and we're going to put this guy here. Then we're going to take our other unit of shifting zones. And we're going to do something like this. Okay. So um, as you can see, I talked about it before. Uh, and I'm going to put this model down. down here. Oh, you're not going to be able to see that. Let me check my camera. Where we're, at. we're actually going to slide this whole thing back a little bit so that we don't lose this. Um, so now imagine, um, you, you may want to play around with exactly what this formation looks like. I, like. As I said, I have not really spent a lot of time uh, getting used to doing this, um, but some folks have reported some success with it. So, uh, and actually, let me see if I have a proxy base so we can really showcase what is going on here. Um, apologies, apologies. Should have been a little better prepared. Uh, what else can I got to do to find a small base proxy? I only have one. Right. Well, I only have one. We'll just have to work with it. So, what you can do is so any model can be any model that doesn't say it can't be placed can be placed. So um, that means the shifting stones and um, and the stone keeper can be placed. Uh, that also applies to battle engines. It applies to um, anything that is not a gargantuan or colossal, basically. Uh, it has to be a friendly faction model in this case. Um, you can't place the sentry stone in the gallows grove because they're, they have a rule that specifically says they can't be placed. Um, and I think that's pretty much it in our faction. Mind you, I might have mistaken something. So imagine now that you're playing Bones Rovers, you want second. Uh, this guy actually deploys, this is actually the 18 inch line of your deployment. Um, you are able actually, one of the things you're able to do is I can activate this unit, so the painted unit of shifting stones, and I can place this stone keeper completely within, um, and we're going to use the proxy base here so we can sort of highlight. We can place him completely within 8 inches of himself. So if you're at 18 inches, that's going to be another 8, um, which is going to put him um, which is going to put him into a situation where um, it's going to put him into a situation where he is um, so we went from 8 inches uh, sorry 18 we had another 8 so we're at the 26 inch line so we're now 2 inches past halfway um, then so reactivated the painted unit to do that so now the model is where the proxy base is now we're going to activate the unit he's a part of the black unit um, and we're going to choose to do um, shifting, so the ability to move the unit. 
as I mentioned before, he cannot be out of formation. They are, in fact, at this point, uh, these... No, no, that's the wrong size, sorry. Um, they actually are out of formation at this point, which is totally fine. Um, you could shorten that. You could probably... Uh, I don't think this is how base works. Yeah, you're not going to be able to be in formation. So he's able to... But he's able, because of the rules of how that's worded, he is always in formation because he is the officer and thus the leader of the unit. So now let's put my... Um, can you see her? Yeah. Yeah, you can see her. So now let's say I have an important solo here that I want to kill. Uh, um, I can now place this guy. I'm gonna, now I'm going to move him completely within 8 inches again. So he can actually be back here, and I can cast a rock hammer at her or um, hit her with the Volge, um, e either one. will probably want to use the rock hammer. It's a higher pow and it's more accurate, uh, especially if you get in the back. And now, if effectively what I have done is suicided this two-point model back into the list. But if this is, for example, um, let's say Gorman, Iris, Ragman, an important model, I just went 26 inches and then I went up to another eight inches. So I'm now at the, uh, let's see, eight. I'm now 34 inches across the table with that model. And theoretically, I can go another eight inch. Rock Hammer is an eight inch range spell. So I could go that, you can't even see because it's off the camera. I can go another eight inches deeper from that if I want to. Um, I'm assuming I went second in this scenario, but if you go first, we can just subtract three inches from these ranges. Where he's standing there, He's able to. Um, he's. Uh, what did I say? He's at 34 inches. Now, if you look at your, your opponent's deployment zone, um, they were at 7 to start with, so um, that's 41. And then their, their 80 is another 6, so 35. So you are 4 inches um, outside of their advanced deploy. And at 8 inch range, you're actually able to throw a rock hammer into their deployment zone. Um, unless they watch this video or have a circle player that's been doing these shenanigans, they're probably not going to see that coming. Uh, and I'm talking about this one because it was actually a request by several viewers um, to sort of go over it. That's what you're able to do. I think this is the ideal situation. You want to try to get it in the back. He's only magic ability six. You're not going to be able to get something like your fulcrum or any other bonus out that far. Um, and that's going to happen. It's also very important when you deploy to make sure your shifting stones are like this because... If not, and as it is, if he doesn't die, they're actually going to have a problem. Um, although your opponent's going to have a problem of you having an accurate magic ability model that far deep. Well, somewhat accurate, POW 14 in their lines. I, I don't think most are going to let it live. Um, and you want to have your shifting stones in the 5-inch formation back here so that they can activate in the next turn. Okay. Um, so that is that particular tactic. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to set him aside for now. Another tactic that you can do, so let's just set up. Uh, one thing I want to point out with Shifting Stones, this is still a triangle. It's a very, very thin triangle and narrow. Let me move that aside as well. But it is a triangle. This is a triangle. This Basically, if there's three of them alive, you can form a triangle. This is a very tiny triangle. But if somebody's base was tucked in here, you could still place. Um, this is a triangle, this is a triangle, this is a triangle. They're all different sizes, types of triangles. So any any formation of three is a triangle. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is creating new shifting stone triangles if you have two units. Um, very important tactic. So let's say, uh, let's say I have a triangle here. Let's say I have my getter except here. So he's clearly not in this triangle of shifting stones. Um, make sure, leader model, that's leader model. Uh, now, let's say, that I have my other triangle of shifting stones is placed like this. And currently, we can easily agree, Geterix, make sure that all my shifting stones are in, yes. We can easily say that Geterix is not in the triangle of shifting stones. However, um, and this is agnostic of any caster you can do this with. However, um, in this case, what I can do is activate this painted unit of shifting stones. I can actually place this shifting stone right here It'll still be in a five inch command. And now this unit is able to place Geterix. Uh, that was way more than eight inches, but he's able to place Geterix. Um, look for things like that. You can even set it up. A lot of opponents, and especially in Mark uh, Three, where A, circle isn't played as much, and B, some of the shifting zone um, 
shenanigans like this are just not things that are on people's minds, um, especially if they didn't even play in Mark II. If they see Getterix there, they're not gonna be they're not gonna be thinking like, oh, he's gonna get placed, and they may just put a bunch of things in here to jam, and then you're gonna be able to uh, do as I highlighted. So, um, so that's one trick. Uh, additionally, if you have uh, if you have Kruger two who has telekinesis, you can do something similar. So, if if this is here, you could obviously t TK Getterix in. You could also use TK to move this shifting stone here, again creating a triangle, allowing you to place. Um, so, those are definitely some tricks. Um, there, the, um, this is just some t tactics I want to talk through real quick. But the, look for things where it says the model has to advance and end its activation. You will not you will not trigger things that require an advance by placing them with shifting stones. So uh, retaliatory strike, for example, on bastions, it can be really important that you try to place your model in their melee range because they um, will not get their defensive strikes if you do so. Um, basically, defensive strikes a big one. Uh, admonitions another one. Uh, let's say th this model has admonition. Obviously, if I walk up, he can move three inches away. If I'm in shifting zones and I place here, I'm going to be able um, to just attack. It, they will not get uh, they will not get the trigger of admonition. Uh, furthermore, if you have a model here that has a shield, another trick to re remember with shifting zones is that you can actually place behind without taking a free strike. So now Deterix is behind the halfway point. We can make attacks and we're going to get plus two to hit. And if there's a shield or shield wall, we also they will also not gain that benefit. Uh, so that can be very key as well. With ranged attacks um, or magic attacks, so we'll use uh, this guy here. You're also going to get additional distance. So um, with he could trample eight inches to do the same thing, but at this point, if you assume an advance and a uh, let's let's say. Um, Eruption of Life from Morvana, his total threat range, I'm gonna move the, the senior cells for a second. His total threat range is a five inch walk and a ten inch um, a ten inch cast. Now he could he could in fact trample eight and then do the additional ten. Um, but to do so is gonna he's gonna spend a fury, and that means he's gonna be able to not boost the attack or the damage roll potentially, and you may need to do both. Um, so if you have shifting zones, you're gonna be able to place here. And then you can go ahead and cast the spell out. Um, additionally, with uh, say like if this was a pure blood warp wolf who has a ten inch spray, um, he does have assault, but you may uh, you may not want him to go all the way as far forward. But this would also extend the threat of that to eighteen inches. Or um, additionally, the celestial fulcrum, which I mentioned, does apply here. Um, you can do the same thing as well. Uh, another. Um, and, that, and that actually gives the fulcrum uh, an 18, a minimum of an 18 inch threat range with the spray and then increases with the, the uh, longer ranges of the additional attacks. Uh, another tactic that's in, that can be very important, uh, and this one is, for, is good for casters that have really strong abilities uh, that, but need to be kept safe. So I do this a lot with, say, Una 2, for example, where I actually want her to stay back pretty far, but I need her to be far forward to um, for Hawker. That gives me, uh, which is the rule that I believe is the rule that gives her uh, battle group sprint, uh, her her light war based sprint. So in this case, what I'm going to do actually is she's going to walk up here. She may actually make her. Uh, she may cast some spells. She may make her ranged attack um, and things like that. But so she walked forward. She's going to stand there for the entire turn. Her griffins will do whatever. They'll sprint. And then at the end of the turn, I'm going to use that unit of shifting stones to return her back to where she came or possibly even farther back as such. Um, this also includes being able to, to run. So that is that is something that you're, um, you're going to be able to do. Um, additionally, to, just to go over it, uh, Black Cloud Wayfarers do interact with shifting stones. Uh, I'm going to use the Stone Keeper to be a Black Cloud Wayfarer. They do one of two things. If they are, I believe it is completely within two inches of a shifting stone, I can place this model anywhere completely within 12 inches. Um, that can be really important when you need to get a model onto a flag. So he can actually walk 
Um, or it, he could get it off of Battle Wizard potentially. I could actually walk this model to here and then do a 12 inch place and get the model here. So I've actually moved this model 18 inches from its original location. And you may even need to place, use shifting for your stones, sometimes to get the stone in the place you need to be able to do that. The other thing they're able to do is um, they can place themselves completely within two inches of a stone. So you can use this early on in the game. You can also use it um, if you want to, to make their melee attack. And you can battle wizard back and you get sort of a, a sprint. And they're actually decent. You need to use this, you want to use the spray a lot of times to get more attacks. But if you know you need to keep that model safer for longer in the game, uh, you can do that. Uh, also, additionally, like I said, you could charge model if it's here. You could then uh, do the other the other place. Um, they can also be interesting if you need. Uh, so, like with Kruger, sometimes I've uh, purposefully placed the model for placed the Black Cloud Wayfarer forward so that I could put a lightning storm, cast a lightning storm at it. It's immune to lightning as long as it's within nine inches of Kruger, and then activated it and brought it back to safety. And now I've got a lightning storm that's in the way. Um, Shifting stones are also very useful for that. They can be beacons for a lot of our, um, if you really need to make sure a spell is in a certain place, like a Hellmouth from uh, Wormwood, for, as an example. Uh, Lightning Storm is another one that potentially you'd want to do. Uh, Shifting Stone is a great target for that because they're only defense five. Okay. Um, the, the other, another thing that you can do early in the turn is, and this depends on your positioning, but if you really want to be able to aggressively put some models forward. Another thing that you could do is this guy, uh, he's actually speed uh, five. So let's say we've got this model and I want him to be a significant ways up the table. I could actually run him 10. Uh, this is on turn one, for example, and then place him completely with an eight. And he's very far, you can, and now he's, um, let's assume you went first for this tactic. Uh, so we've got seven, 13, um, well, he's at seven. He could run his full 10 to 17. Uh, he may not, can he go that far? 17. Let's make sure. So I'm actually going to measure off the back of my table here. So there's, he's at seven. We're doing it live, folks. So if he's at seven, he runs 10. Yeah. He runs 10. So, you know, this is probably more for the wolves. He runs 10. He's going to be in that shifting stone triangle. Now I can place him another eight. Um, so he is at the 25 inch line. Um, be very careful not to do that in a case where somebody can attack to the 25 inch line on the um, uh, going second. Um, but if they can't, if they have a slower army, really taking advantage of the fact that you can get up a long ways is going to be key. Uh, I watched a video where um, Tomasz from Poland, who's very uh, had a lot of success with playing wolves. I watched a video today actually. Um, he plays against the Dreamer. You can see it on his channel. Where what he did on turn one actually with his two units. This was actually a wolf. Guardian, so it was back a little farther. But what he did, let's say this is the AD line, uh, what he did actually was place the, the model within eight inches here. There was a piece of terrain back here, and then he placed these models like this. So now that now that World Guardian is going to be able to move up the table a considerable amount of distance, and that was with Bradius, so he's gonna go even farther. Okay, I'm trying to think. So we've gone over um, just the general rules of how the unit works. We've gone over uh, placement. Another thing, actually, something just to keep in mind, I have had this come up well, as I'm sort of going through. So if you have a battle group centric list, so I, I had this come up with my, uh, my Chromac uh, 2 list, and I was playing as a Fianna player who won the role to go first. So I am very much out threatened by the list. And I didn't actually execute it as well as I needed to, but what I did, and they only have... Um, all of his models are, let me think about that, not all of his models, but most of his models only have uh, a, at most they have a two inch melee, and you can't end, even if you have flight, you can't end on a model. So what I'm able to do here, I need to measure this a little bit, is you can kind of measure out, so that's two inches, right? So a large base, just a smidge. A large base has to have almost two inches to fit. So you can see, and you can spread these just a little bit. What you want to do, um, and if it's one inch bases, you actually have even better uh, 
a better scenario. So if, if or sorry, one inch melee. If it's one inch melee, you can do things like this, and the models are just not going to be able to get through. So now they have to get through um, armor eighteen five wound models to actually even get attacks here. And if they're a battle group centric list and they have to use battle group models, they're going to be in the way of being able to do that unless they have something like spring. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, with the Stonekeeper, the one thing I did go, didn't go over is he does grant the unit Prowl. Um, that is particularly useful. Um, I mean, Table's going to make it useful in some cases, but it's particularly useful for uh, with Kai 3 and Morvana 2 because they have Fog of War, which is going to trigger their Prowl, and they'll functionally just have Stealth all the time. The other caster, uh, and I might be missing somebody, but the other caster off the top of my head that that is useful with is going to be Una 2. And in the same vein, what you can do with, she has Twister, and as I said, generally you can hit Shifting Stones pretty easily with um, with spells. And in some cases, one of the strongest plays she can set up is probably going to be um, using them as a Cloud Wall. So you can do something like this. That's totally legal placement. Um, and now these models have stealth. You can't see this guy. You can't see, I mean, he can be wherever, as long as he's within seven. You're not going to be able to see the models behind. Um, and if you need a triangle, you could even do something like that. He's As long as he uses his armor ability, he's going to probably be able to live through that without a problem. It's a POW 10, armor 18, armor 17 models. Should live. She could roll a 12 on the damage. You'd be really sad. But the cloud would still be there anyway, so um, at least you would have that functionality. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to start wrapping up, but uh, these are some tactics. Uh, if anybody has any questions or uh, some more advanced ideas than what I saw, I think really mastering your positioning with Shifting Stones is one of the things that's going to, as a circle player, um, especially if you're playing in Bones or Range Heavy List, where I think it excels a little bit more, because um, it's not really ever going to extend the melee threat range of most of our pieces, uh, the, with the exception of the Wolf Guardian. Um, but it is really going to put them into awkward positions. It's going to help you with your scenario play. Um, it's going to help you keep your caster safe. It's going to help you get the most value out of your ranged attacks and your magic attacks. Um, you might be able to use the Stonekeeper trick to kill a model. Um, there's also some movement things where um, once you start adding other movement pieces in, like Telekinesis, Warpath, um, not so much Mirage, uh, Sprint, uh, another one that I didn't mention, but uh, we'll, we'll throw it out there. So someone like Morvana, Kaya, um, or anybody who uses Lightning Strike Animus, if you're very, very concerned with the positioning of your model, you're able to, this is actually six, but pretend, uh, well, I got a five here. So let's pretend we've got uh, Morvana here. She repositions five. Now I can place her again um, eight inches. So that's another, another one of those tactics. It's sort of like the one that I mentioned before. You're able to use to keep safe or to get um you might also be able to get to a flag or something that you weren't able to uh running into the stones and placing um i can't really go over every single in iteration uh instance that shifting stones are going to be available to you but they are it mastering how they work um it, there was a video today actually by privateer where um Pagani, who played a lot of circle in mark ii um and still does in playtest i assume talked about how how you play your shifting stones is really kind of a mini game within the game and it's important as a circle player to know which way you need to use them um the the more you master this particular unit even and this is more important in the previous edition but in this edition i would argue that it's still important especially with certain casters um to understand fully the ways that they're used and sort of the creativity that comes with using them uh i've always sort of thought that circle uh, one of the things with Circle is that people, a lot of people in the game are, are really planning, are, are fully planning out uh, exactly how every little thing in the game is going to work. Uh, a lot of people play things like Signar and Crix and Kador, where you you typically have fairly strict, Crix has some tricks, Signar has some tricks, but usually they're re reasonably linear, and you just need to give... Um, you need to sort of see like where I need to allocate, like maybe I need to over allocate a resource to do this particular task, things like that. Uh, shifting stones really reward creativity, in my opinion. Um, you need to be creative with how they're positioned, how they're keeping things safe, how far forward they are, how far backward they are, um, you, what sort of placement shenanigans you're gonna do, 
how you're going to move models. Um, they become way more important to certain casters. I think almost any Bones Borboros list is looking to have a minimum of one, probably both units. I think Kruger 2 is another caster who frequently is going to gain a lot from the units because of adding TK to the placement effects. Um, I like it with a Fulcrum because it automatically is extending its threat. Uh, same with Loki. Um, where that eight, you know, the, the eight inch drag without the shifting zones only threatens, uh, pardon me, 14 inches, you're automatically getting that extra 16 inches right away. Um, and if we ever, um, if you play mono theme or we ever have some ch themes changed to allow him to be with Kruger 2, um, then again, you're getting just that much more, more movement. Um, when to use them defensively, when to use them offensively, when to, when to sacrifice them because they're very durable, but you're going to keep your battle group alive. Um, when to put them in the way, um, something I didn't illustrate, but they're, they're models. And even though they're small base models, you can't have something land on them. Now you can do this trick with any model, but sometimes you can't place them. But if there's say a huge base in front of you, and again, much like the trick I was showing, if I do something like this and there's a huge base here, this, this is within their charge range, but they're going to have to clear out all these stones, even to tramp like these stones to trample and this one to be able to charge. And that's sometimes going to require a lot of um, effort from their their battle group. Um, again, when to use them for, for their healing aspect, when to use them to place your caster. Um, there's going to be individual tricks that each caster likes to use them for. Uh, I wouldn't absolutely say that every single list needs a unit or two units of shifting stones, but I think there's a lot of lists that can gain a lot from doing so. Um, as you get more war beasts in your list, I think shifting zones become that much more important um, all the time. Um, things that need to be healed, so they can really help mitigate. Um, like for Morvana two, she cuts herself for, with for rerolls a lot. They're going to be great there. Or Balder two, who damage who takes damage from his own abilities, and so forth. So those are just a few things that shifting zones do. Um, I'm gonna you know this video will probably post uh, soon. If there are any questions, please uh, add them. Um, Join in the Facebook group, uh, the Discord channel, hit me up on Twitter. Um, you can hit up some comments on, on the show itself. Um, although I think if you want to get in any lengthy discussion, uh, Facebook or Discord is probably going to be your best bet. Uh, hopefully you gained something from this. Uh, it was, it's sort of a good refresher even for me to go through it. Um, and as always, if you like my content, please let me know. Uh, subscribe, share, and we will see you next time.